This is Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneurs the Playbook, and I have a very special entrepreneur. Number one, she's the CEO of Shift7, which is truly an innovative entrepreneurial venture that we're going to get into. But past history, one of the most extraordinary things is Megan Smith was the United States CTO, Chief Technology Officer, third one ever, mm -hmm. and uh, just an extraordinary person. And I'm so blessed to have you on here because I'd love for you to share the journey that you've experienced and the lessons that you've learned. So we'll start, you're a mathematician, an MIT person, very logical. And, <laughs> and you're, and you're an it's interesting because you think like I, I'm, uh, you know, I have an engineering background, I'm a mechanical engineer, and uh, to math, science, et cetera. But really, if you think about design and engineering, it's actually a very creative, intuitive, art centric well, I think thing the universe well. is a so technology. It's combining these, right? It's combining <laughs> right? these. Yeah, so, so, and one of the challenges we have, just to kind of stay on that one topic, Gary, for a sec, is we have these weird ideas about who's good at different things. And so we don't think like the universe doesn't separate all the subjects, but we do. So, how do we help ourselves? bring more confidence to everyone about playing in any of the areas and feeling comfortable in them. It's so cool that you said that because I know one of my favorite stories is about SAP and the CEO there who son had autism. Mm -hmm. And I've always said, you know, every strength has its place, mm -hmm. but so does every weakness. And yeah. if you move a weakness to a different place, all of a sudden it becomes a strength. And yeah. in relationships, it's true as well. That's why you, most of the time you don't want a relationship with someone with the exact same strengths as you. Mm -hmm. um, in this case too, you're mobilizing these strengths to find their certain niches or places. Um, Shift7, mm -hmm. which is, you know, as you move through, I think, Google to the CTO, that, that was the path, uh -huh. and then into your own venture. Yeah. Where, where do you see the differences of, you know, you're one of the, the first thousand employees, I think, at Google, mm -hmm. seven years there. Mm -hmm. 11. Eleven. Seven years, I did a bunch of work as the vice president of new business development, that was my main job, and it had a lot of parts. It's actually to entrepreneurship it's related because it's entrepreneurship inside of the company. I call it entrepreneurship. Yeah, entrepreneurship. <laughs> so tons of that because if you look at Google, about half of the major products from it came from people inside. Come, of course, search. You know, the yeah. first one and ads related to that as it came in. But things like Gmail and Google Docs, other 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 products. Um, Actually, Docs comes from, from acquisitions, but a set of products. And then there's a set of products that came from actually acquisitions of amazing, talented teams. And so whether it was amazing teams in-house, I was uh, the lead of new business development and we worked as the partnerships team. So let's say the Gmail team was just emerging and they needed anti-spam deal or we're <laughs> scanning books for book search and we need to call the publishers and talk about what kind of deal could be striped or, or maybe we're going to talk to the libraries. All those first-of-a-kind partnerships my team did all of that work with the amazing engineers and product managers across the whole company. And then we also, in the early days, I did acquisitions of Google Earth and Maps and Picasa. And then we eventually split those teams so another corp dev team kept going. But bringing those teams into the company um, and working together with product engineering with them and letting them actually lead. So for example, Geo worked a lot on, on those products. That Geo team that came in, whether it was Keyhole, was a company for Google Earth, where to tech was a company that was doing a lot of mapping and visualization of, of maps themselves as we see it today. And then a little one called ZipDash that was doing traffic at the day, like 2004. They blended together and became the leaders of Geo for Google. So it wasn't like someone came and said, you know, you all work here and then everybody left. They came and led and built that stuff. So um, I was able to be at Google during those times and work with these extraordinary talent. And it speaks to a lot of things you talk about on the show and in the podcast entrepreneurs and innovation and coming from like coming from people's passion and giving them a platform and a space to do that and great teammates around and coaches and president obama saw the importance of entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and of technology when he created the position as a cto of the united states yeah. and as you had the position i was thinking okay so what types of things evolve in entrepreneurship because i would think as the chief technology officer a lot of it had to pertain to to security Mm -hmm. But yet, all the different solutions that you listed out from Google, although they're not within the realm of security, mm -hmm. they're so important to understand in order to create a secure environment, a secure digital environment, yep. which truly, I think, is one of the biggest threats that we have to our country. Mm -hmm. And as it evolves, I think we don't even know what could be a threat. How, how did that 
uh, transition occur and what skill sets do you think were the most utilized from what you learned at Google? Yeah, very much so. And also in Shift 7, I'm on a couple of commissions, the Global Tech Panel in Europe and also the Kofi Annan Commission around elections and democracy. So yes, exactly. So <laughs> not only security, but also the complexities of social media and fake news and and how, and bullying, you know, bullying people, candidates, et cetera. How, how do we want to be? What are our values and how do we want to be? And how do we want these technologies and, and tools to be uh, in the world? So specifically for President Obama, I think he saw this incredible group of talented people in the government. And just, he noticed sort of tech people in other sectors. And he noticed that that group was in certain rooms, you know, if you go to NASA, yeah. you know, top engineering <laughs> and talent innovators, uh, National Institute of Health, scientists and other data scientists, others, um, Precision Medicine Initiative, um, Department of Energy, et cetera. In the government, there are extraordinary technical people. We have national labs all over the country. We also have our military technical leadership um, for security and other things. And, and also the chief information officer, which does a lot more IT and security, and the tech officer. My job was much more sort of innovation and new methods. Okay. So we had that. But what we didn't have was in sort of every room, that kind of tech person there, like you would have maybe a surgeon general or an operator, a lawyer. You don't say, oh, there's lawyers, like as if it's a sector. Uh, <laughs> right. And then there's <laughs> the government. You're like, lawyers are in the private sector, civil, uh, nonprofit, you know, academic, they're Sports. everywhere. Sports <laughs> is everywhere, I hope. You know, we have bodies, we want to like play, we got passion. Um, and so the same idea, shouldn't technical people be everywhere? And the president could see that it wasn't about not the talent, the talent that was there was tremendous, adding seats to the table. And you see it in the private sector. There's usually a chief technology officer, a chief information officer, a chief data scientist, and others. You know, when you're working on diversity inclusion, a diversity inclusion officer together with people opportunities, we just build the capability of our team. You know, in like a Navy SEALs team, you, if you leave people off the team, you can't run the mission. Right. It's interesting because Shift 7 hits a key component of what I believe to be so important is that we have to start rethinking everything mm -hmm. because things have shifted so quickly that, you know, our financial institutions, our education, our political, all of these different institutions that are aligned with these global initiatives. I know we work with SAP and their innovation mm -hmm. studio there with the 17 global initiatives. Mm -hmm. But the world's biggest issues can be solved with technology. And mm -hmm. it's not, not a popular thing to say, but I always even look at you know, global warming or climate change, as they say, mm -hmm. you know, we have a big hole in our atmosphere, which can, you know, scientifically be seen mm -hmm. that we have a thinning of our atmosphere. Well, technology could cure that, mm -hmm. right? Someone could create Catholic some kind culture, of spray yeah. or, right? And, or and eventually. Even, even in that one, um, it's about, we have created the internet, right? So the internet is actually just us connected. So we could use the internet in new ways to scout and scale for people who have genius things already and they're not we have these tech sector centers but those are fabulous people and there's other people so specifically like with climate and other other uh, poverty justice you know any kind of problem you can look around you're sort of like oh my god what should we do about this problem instead lift up and be like look around look around your own company and your organization who's already solving this other organization partners who out in the world so we put up a website um we approached the United Nations. When I was CTO, we approached a, a talented team there um, together with the UN Foundation and others and created something called the Solution Summit, the UN Solution Summit. We actually just post a page asking who's already solving the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 goals. Wow. And we got, the first year we got 800 people out of the world. This year we got 1,400 submissions in three weeks from 141 countries against all the different goals. And so this like, we call it collective genius. You know, there's so collective much conscious. talent. <laughs> yeah, collective conscious. Yeah. So using the internet to like scout for talent. And then how do you treat that same talent? You know, thinking about sports, what do you do when you have great talent? You bring coaches and teammates and you start working together um, and you practice it. Practice makes permanent. Yeah. So how do you help this set of entrepreneurs to be lifted by the kind of um, acceleration partners that we see, say Silicon Valley or Austin, Boston, Singapore, the, that kind of crew gets. You but just, maybe you're from Ghana, so let's help you. Yeah, we were just with a creative company in Baltimore, for mm -hmm. example, and they're drawing talent, unbelievable skills from South America, from Eastern Europe, in basements with really slow connections and really slow computers. Mm -hmm. And we were discussing with an ex-NFL star, you know, 
how do we leverage that and get them the right equipment so we can even solve these problems uh, faster. You said something that really sparked my interest. You said practice makes permanent. Yeah. And that's something like internally as human beings from cellular to subconscious to conscious mm -hmm. to our own chromosomes, DNA, but also just in the ethereal when I'm training or coaching people, I keep trying to stress that practice makes permanent. Yeah. And in the habits are disciplined. Yeah. yeah. Can you, because you're so much more enlightened about this and educated, can you explain that in your, sure. your vision of and what practice makes permanent means? Totally, and it comes from um, my swimming coach uh, from MIT, and uh, a guy named John Benedict, who's fabulous. Um, NCAA Coach of the Year many times in our Division Three world. Um, I'm, I'm in that same world. So, <laughs> yeah, I was a swimmer. So, as a swimmer, if you, every time you come to the wall, one of the things he was always teaching us, you know, just from a swimming analogy, if you didn't, like, hit the wall hard later, when you're in the race, someone can out-touch you, you know? So there's all these things that you just need to kind of make permanent into how you do things. And so that can come into business. I remember um, there's an extraordinary professor I had at school who actually said, uh, I was, we were talking about New England championships, um, and uh, he, I was telling him, he was asking me lots of details. And you know how passionate we are about sports. So he was saying, you know, someday you'll feel that way about your work. And he's exactly right. And we all know that you can translate across sectors. And so that same thing, like we all know from, even from P, if you're not an athlete in PE class or whatever you do, uh, that, that whatever kinds of practices you have are going to become permanent. I think that one of my favorite examples, I'm going to show you a little a Please. picture. Yeah. So one of my favorite examples is practicing a lot of different things. This particular one is about our kids. And uh, it's a picture of from the White House Science Fair. So... Uh, this is a picture. So imagine the White House full of kids. You know, this is President yeah. Obama. Many presidents have done this. What's going on in this picture? The president walks up, asks the kids what they do, and they've made a page turning robot. So just a couple key things. First off, that's awesome. You know, <laughs> little kids. But that they have done something using technology to help other people, right? Because they're going to try to help people who have disabilities. They also like look at this. They're dressed in capes. This, how fun is this, right? That's so so good. we're teaching kids. You know, when you're when you're a child. You learn reading and writing. You start in preschool with letters, right? You learn words. You learn sentences. Eventually, by high school, you can write an essay, right? A pretty yeah. profound essay. But we don't have that assumption about everybody for inventing and discovery. So for science, for STEM subjects, science, math, computer science, we expect you to like kind of absorb everything everybody else figured out. And yeah, you get to do lab. But when you do lab, it's usually a, you know the answer. It's not like science fair where you don't know the answer, and together we're going to discover, together we're going to invent. And yeah. so having kids practice makes permanent, learn that. That's amazing. From this age group. And so listen to what the president's conversation was. He said to the kids, like, okay, this is fabulous. How'd you guys do this? And they said, we had a brainstorming. <laughs> they're I love like, a brainstorming. They're like kindergarten, first grade, yeah. right? And everybody's laughing. And it's, it, but it's real. Like, think about that. What if you did that when you were that age? And it's then he said, and then, yeah, what did you do next? We made some prototypes. So, if all kindergartners and first graders in the United States or around the world got to do brainstorming prototyping around STEM, just like they kind of brainstorm and prototype about writing something, a sentence or a poem, right? What if we had that kind of capability around this knowledge? We could solve a lot of things. So again, practice makes permanent. And the more we can have STEM and tech experiences throughout our whole lifetime, whether it's when we're in school at all levels, from the Muscogee Tree Creek tribe in Oklahoma teaches robotics from Head Start, three and four-year-olds. Wow. So there's, it's not too early to start any of this stuff. Yeah, I think and we're so realizing that's, that. So that's practice makes permanent. It's like what you do is what you do. And for entrepreneurs, um, remembering to be mindful about team and and uh, and reaching out to everybody and saying you know who's got ideas and getting people to collaborate the way great coaches can you know that's a hard skill and you What's see important. this huge shift uh, in our economy to freelancers or entrepreneurs uh -huh. you know I think I read from 2027 on there'll be over 50 percent of the employees in America will be freelancers mm -hmm. of sorts which means they have to be more entrepreneurial mm -hmm. and I'm not sure everyone is prepared for what that's like, mm -hmm. right? We've grown so quickly, but there's certain securities, routines, and disciplines that occur when you work for a big company. Yes. 
you know, you work for Google and mm -hmm. I've been there many, many times and have been jealous as an entrepreneur going, gosh, this would be nice to have food every 10 feet. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and, other things. They, and great benefits and all the yeah. wonderful things that Google does. How do you see, you know, at Shift 7, that growth over the next decade as far as being an entrepreneur mm -hmm. and adjusting to what these new employees or freelancers are, are going to require or need? Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that we did as a project, you know, our, our Shift 7 company is really, the goal of it is the, to continue the kind of work that we got the chance or the honor to do, you know, on behalf of the American people with President Obama. Um, I mean, during USCTO time, one of my other uh, co-founders, I have three co-founders, two other co-founders, um, is was at the UN. So how do we take those worlds that are more sort of social entrepreneurship and civics and that, but bring the plays that we have in the innovation sector and have innovation across all sectors. And so this idea of scout and scale communities of practice, uh, sprints, you know, and pilots and, and pivoting at things, like all these words actually from sports that you could apply um, in, these, in these sectors are important. And especially, you know, when we were in government, governments have to constantly upgrade you know, they're hundreds of years old sometimes, like ours. <laughs> or uh, I always say, like, President Lincoln got the Pony Express, you know, and then <laughs> he had to upgrade to the Telegraph. So it's not a new idea. Um, it's just that it's our turn, and we have to dust off the budgets and find the new ways to do things. And, we, and the way to do that is about people. It's who knows how to do that, and are they in my team? Do I have the broad enough to do I need new capabilities? You know, uh, FDR created the science advisor position. You know, of course, President Washington already was doing tech in the beginning. He was technical himself. Um, <laughs> but he had the Army Corps of what becomes the Army Corps of Engineers, Corps of Eng, which actually built Bunker Fort before the country was founded. So we've always had tech and innovation. It's just in our time we had that. And so same thing for the social sectors, um, moving that in here. So for Shift 7, our, t our job, our role, our, our focus is to try to continue to bring kind of tech forward innovation methodologies for faster scaled impact in other sectors. And part of that is about thinking about solution making as an inclusion experience. I the that. more you can include people, the more surface area of doers, the more we're gonna solve. So if we could, it's sort of like a theory, like if we include everyone, we could fix nearly everything. Yeah. And, and team up and, and get people to do, you know, the example I gave about the kids practicing around STEM and playing around STEM, but doing impactful things like for other people. That's amazing. I always say, everybody already knows their why, it's to help others. Mm -hmm. And we're just not wise enough to admit it and figure out the what and the how. Last question deals with inclusion because a mm -hmm. lot of your business is about inclusion. And I find it ironic. Um, I worked for West Publishing when they first launched Westlaw. So we had mm -hmm. Boolean language searching into natural language yep. searching. Sure, sure. Have a pre-Google company yeah, with, yeah. with data and at Westlaw. Yeah. And but the interesting thing I've seen through the evolution of technology is that it really is a very inclusive thing. We yeah. have connected the world. There's mm -hmm. people, and yet I feel today that there's this separation or at least an interference or corrosion between the connections that we have. So totally. you have idealistic people like St. Jude mm -hmm. that have been posting everything they know about cancer just so somebody can solve it, yeah. and then there's other people that buy and spend millions of dollars on security so nobody can know mm -hmm. what they're doing research on mm -hmm. cancer for. What do you see moving forward as far as inclusion are the biggest challenges that we face with technology of, of creating that inclusion? Yeah, it's, it, this is like probably our biggest challenge, which is how are we gonna get everyone in the future? What's the inclusive future of work, of AI, of a living planet, you know? and how do we take our values, our most indigenous, indigenous of values, which go, you know, all the way back into in, here in our country, you know, Native Americans, who was on this land here, you know, indigenous people around the world who have such brilliant systems thinking. Um, there's a wonderful PBS show called Native America, which is about the Native American communities who were here and are, of course, still here, um, <laughs> thankfully. Uh, but we're here at the time and how far ahead they were in systems thinking, which would have kept us from our more colonial way of thinking that got us into so much climate change trouble. So I think thinking in new ways, especially as entrepreneurial leaders, the more diverse your team is, the better it's gonna be, the better your products, it's proven, better products, better profits, but also better cultural experience. Sometimes a little bit harder, you know, to, to figure out how to all get along. But 
in technology, it's interesting, the biases. So we have these ideas through the 80s. I'm, we're doing a series right now working on some things about lost histories of, of women, um, and, and t especially technical women. A woman invented computer science, and most people don't know that. Her name is Ada Lovelace, and she wrote at the same time as Darwin. And when she wow. wrote, Darwin wrote about our past, as we know, and his paper is known. And she wrote a 55-page paper attached as to a 20-page translation. She wasn't allowed to publish or be part of the Royal Society at the time, but she attached it and out there her notes, including the first algorithm ever written. And she said, she was Lord Byron's poet math daughter. She said, I wish to bequeath to the generations a calculus of the nervous system. And she predicted all the way, calculus could be into quantum, like these great ideas of what could be. And she always wanted us to see working with technology, not in replacing ourselves with it. So I think realizing the truth, you know, whether it's that movie Hidden Figures and you see that Katherine Johnson did yeah. calculate the trajectories for the moon mission um, and including John Glenn wouldn't fly without Ch Catherine checking the math, like an uh, incredibly talented, genius mathematician, woman of color. So how do we have more visibility that everybody's been awesome the whole time? Um, and one of the challenges, like take tech 15 to one, boy programmers to girl programmers in children's and family TV. Like we're just so propagandized, stereotyped that we're even writing that into our children's shows and then the kids line up accordingly. You know, Kate, the Duchess of Cambridge, um, uh, I walked in the Oval Office right after Prince William left and, uh, and I said to President Obama, sir, what you and I are about to do is related to Prince William because we were gonna go do a coding thing and he said, how's that? I said, well, the, the princess wife, Kate, Duchess Cambridge, her grandmother and great aunt were code breakers at Bletchley Park. Bletchley Park is from that movie wow. Imitation Game, if you've ever seen it, yeah. a story. Um, this is the team in England during World War II that cracked the Nazi Enigma codes. And they uh, shortened the war by two years and saved 11 million lives is what they're credited with by being able to listen in and crack the codes. That team was two thirds women, including Kate's grandmother and great aunt. Wow. So, and yet it's 25 to one boy visitors to girl visitors to that museum because computers are for boys, right? <laughs> They're for everybody. And the network is for everybody. And the more we collaborate and look for who's already doing it and lift them up no matter who or where they are, inside your org, outside your org. Um, I mentioned Ghana earlier. Uh, from Ghana came EcoRide, the Ghana Bamboo Bike Initiative. They grow bikes to sequester so, carbon. And there's not a big steel industry in Ghana. So they can have you know, bamboo instead, right? So just such genius stuff all around the planet that we could be opting into new systems if we included everyone. So well, that's what we're focused on. And that's what I'm focused on as well. And there's nobody better than you to lead the way, Megan Smith. It certainly is a pleasure and honor. You have to check this out. I think when we look back in history, they'll definitely be aware of Megan Smith and the impact that she's had and the acceleration that we all can have if we work together. Dave Meltzer with Megan Smith here on Entrepreneurs, The Playbook. Thanks, Dave. Thank you.